He also defended, was defending James Earl Ray in a retrial. James Earl Ray said, look, I didn't shoot him. Look, there are lots of people who wanted to kill King. Lots of people would step forward to do it. Okay? The fact that you have army snipers do it, doing it means that this is also happening with the full knowledge of the White House. Do you trace James Earl Ray's movements for that assassination? It's obvious that he's being manipulated and you know, controlled by somebody. Sure. I mean, how do you get out of the country without a passport? Hmm. Anyway, the idea is, yes, he was assassinated. You know, a lot of us felt you know, before this trial that the government had a hand in Dr. In Dr. King's death. It was proven in the court of law. You have never heard that. It was not a news item in 1999, was it? Okay, but there is a book, and basically there are trial transcripts, etc., etc. Yeah, An active state. Yeah. The assassination of Martin Luther King. By his lawyer. His relationship with J. Edgar Hoover is very suspect. Sure. Well, well, yeah. That Hoover hated him one. Hoover con considered him, or actually was quoted as saying that Martin Luther King is the most dangerous Negro in America. So, the head of the FBI says that you're the most dangerous Negro in America. What do you do to the most dangerous Negro in America? Huh. Terrorists watch the FBI's most want. Well, you can't put someone who's only been in jail for civil disobedience on the most wanted list. He's not a criminal. Except for that. Those are misdemeanors. Hmm. What makes him dangerous then? More dangerous than the Black Panthers? who actually have guns? Huh. What is so dangerous about him? So that's why I'm saying in terms of Asada Shakur. What's so dangerous about a 64-year-old woman living in Cuba who makes occasional internet pronouncements? Influence on people. Influence on people. Oh, more people don't, you don't want her to think, her to influence folks? So killing her, putting her back in prison is gonna like stop that? A little late. The last years of King's life, when 72% of whites and 55% of blacks disapproved of King's correct opposition to the Vietnam War and how his efforts to end eradicate poverty were tied to Vietnam, people didn't feel that, that was accurate. Well, he's basically saying, look, the war is draining resources that we could use to basically take people out of poverty in America. And to do what? You are not going to have the, you know, basically the idea is, for example, if you, I didn't necessarily talk about this when we were looking at the 50s, but when Eisenhower made his famous tin and tungsten speech, this is the reason we're in Vietnam, not to stop communism, but because of the strategic resources that are in Vietnam. Tin, tungsten, and oil. Wait, so 55,000 American soldiers died because of tin and tungsten? Why don't you just cut a deal? Because Ho Chi Minh wanted to cut a deal, actually, by his words. Hmm. King's dream of a more democratic America had been, in his, his words, a nightmare, owing to the, to the persistence of racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. He called America a sick society. On the Sunday after his assassination in 68, he was to have preached a sermon titled, Why America May Go to Hell. It was actually in his pocket when he was shot down, the notes for it. Why America May Go to Hell. Now, he didn't think that America ought to go to hell, but rather it might go to hell owing to its economic injustice, cultural decay, and political paralysis, in his words. You're talking about democracy, but basically you are oppressing people by keeping, you know, like if you're, you say that allegedly you're a Christian nation, like Jesus didn't do this stuff. So a preacher basically calling you to task is saying, right.
Yes. Um, so between uh, Martin and Marco, did they, um, <coughs> considering they practice different uh, faiths, you know, Martin was a Christian and Marco was Muslim, did they have differences you know, according to what they believe in? Somewhat. Uh, Malcolm's parents were Garveyites. So Marcus Garvey basically preached a, horror, a sort of self-reliance and also black pride. Yeah, his parents were Garveyites and his father was killed by the Klan. Malcolm's father was killed by the Klan. Marcus Garvey. We learned about them second term, but Marcus Garvey. So part of what Garvey was talking about was essentially, you know, look, we need, we need to go back to Africa. We need to have our scientists, our artisans, our businesses, et cetera, et cetera, within America. Either go back to Africa, but if we're not going back to Africa, then we need to basically improve our community because we can't depend on the United States to improve us. And that's what basic, you know, that's what Malcolm's basic message while within the nation of Islam. Look, you cannot trust racist America to do the right thing. You can't. Don't try. Stop waiting. Make it happen yourself, which is dangerous, but it's self-reliant. And so when he talks about, you know, I was having this discussion in my office today about, you know, 12 step programs. And I said, look, when 12 step programs have name familiarity for alcoholism and addiction, but the most prolific or the most effective program for recovery for black people in America, and this is according to a black Republican conservative 12 stepper. He said the most effective program for black people getting them off of drugs, out of gangs, and out of prison is not 12 steps, but the nation of Islam. Okay? They take over housing pro programs, get rid of drug dealing gangs out of public housing without firing a shot. They do prison outreach. Okay? They, you know, and their approach is effective. You don't hear about it because, you know, where are you going to hear about that? But, I mean, this is a conservative black Republican, Peter Bell, who was a consultant to Reagan and Bush one about addictions in the black community. And he's a Republican. And he's saying that. All right? So, when you look at programs like the Nation of Islam, like I'm not necessarily all down with Farrakhan, but I am, I can make alliances you know, against addiction and why that program would work better than 12-step. Mostly because it addresses racism and systemic inequity and 12-step programs do not. They strictly look at addiction without looking at addiction is being caused by something, yo. You need to fight against that besides getting your head straight. All right, so the reason I have this graphic here, go to slide please. James Brown created Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud as a response to Martin Luther King's assassination. And as a, to focus for long-term action. So, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Some people say we've got a lot of malice. Some say it's a lot of nerve. But I say we won't quit moving until we get what we deserve. We've been buked and we've been scorned. We've been treated bad and talked about just as just bones. But it takes two eyes to make a pair. Ha! Brother, we can't quit till we get our share. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. One more time. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. I worked on jobs with my feet in my hand, but all the work I did was for the other man. Now we demand a chance to do things for ourselves. We're tired of beating our head against the wall. And working for someone else. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. We're people, we're just like the birds and the bees. We'd rather die on our feet than be living on our knees. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. You should, if you never listen to this to, tune closely, check it out. 
James Brown. So I use the dictionary to basically look at what this is fighting against, essentially. You know, to even say that I'm black and I'm proud is basically trying to undo centuries of the dictionary, which this uh, particular one, of course, um, defines. I remember, I showed you this, right? So I can skip through this now? Yes? Yes. Uh, so, coming in the wake of um, Martin's assassination, 68 Olympics in Mexico City, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. They took gold and uh, bronze, respectively. and uh, made a choice to uh, make a political statement, black gloves, the protest, uh, actually what was also going on in uh, Mexico City, which uh, hundreds of students had been killed uh, by the Mexican government to clear out space around the uh, Olympic Village. So, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. The 60s had seen the watch, March on Washington, the deaths of W.E.B. Du Bois in, in, uh, in Ghana, death of the Kennedys, Martin, Malcolm X, and King, had seen the birth of the Black Power Movement and Woodstock Nation. It was a time of affirmative action, the war on poverty, the war in Vietnam. Nonviolent civil rights movement gave way to self-defense and talk of violent revolution. And meanwhile, there was an internal revolution brewing, as was the, the means to counter it. So that internal revolution was brewing. So education as a means to liberation, which had always been a theme since pre-colonial Africa about education and the connection to slavery. Slavery was, a slave was somebody that did not master themselves but could improve themselves through education. So education as a means to liberation, the rediscovery of history, culture, critique, and a dialectic. So a dialectic is a discussion about what's going on that leads to actual solutions. Critique is not just criticizing something, but it's also saying, okay, this is how it works, good or bad. This is what keeps it in place, good or bad, right? Questioning the values and assumptions of Western civilization, debating what to replace it with and how best to replace it. So revolution, evolution, transformation from within, and then we come to what we refer to as black gnosis. Now, that word gnosis is Greek for to know. where we get knowledge. But to know on a deep level. So it's transformative knowledge. So an internal revolution was brewing. And of course the means to counter it. So, black gnosis is how we take from our amenta, our inner storehouse of universal knowledge, the knowledge of what was and what can be and said about making it what is. Yeah, that's deep. I'm gonna say it again. How we take from our amenta, Okay, so 
Here's where this is coming from. The Netarians So basically, this is the Egyptian mystery schools. Their pedagogy, that is their belief in how you get educated, is that every human being, every human being, has the wisdom of the universe within them already. It's like a software package, if you will. And that inner set of knowledge is your amenta. Okay? Your inner storehouse of universal knowledge. So you have the wisdom of the universe in you already. The purpose of education is to bring it up. In fact, this is where in the Latin sense, educar, to draw out, that's where that come from. Not from the Romans. Not from the Greeks. From Kemet. Which is where the Greeks got their schooling. Which is what they said. Right? So, your inner store of knowledge. And the knowledge of what was. That's why we learn history. And what can be. Whether it's happened or not and set about making that happen. Because sometimes you want to make something happen that's never happened before, at least according to history. All right, so your amenta and your gnosis is how we knows this. Can I share something real quick? Yeah. Uh, I just learned this today that, because uh, like so much of like Western society doesn't want to um, well, they like deny the fact that you know all this, a lot, all this civilization and knowledge and all that came from Africa, like you're just talking about. But I just found out that um, persuasion, uh, rhetoric, mm -hmm. it was like it used to be a standard in in colleges to like learn, but it was a standard for the Reckon society, and um, like it basically the definition of it, well, or like not necessarily definition, but they learned it. It was somehow documented that it was to. It was. They studied how to approach the Pharaoh, mm -hmm. like, and that's like written in like the books, of maybe Aristotle, or somewhere along the lines there. Yeah. So, yeah, that was. That would be dangerous. Teaching common people how to approach the Pharaoh, mm -hmm. asking questions. Mm -hmm. I'm mentioning the Aquarian bookstop because uh, this was in my hood. This is down the street from my house. South Central. Doesn't exist anymore, but it's basically the model for black bookstores. And it was, while it existed, the oldest black bookstore in the country. Alfred Ligon, founder of the country's oldest continuously operated black-owned bookstore whose belief in metaphysics eased his sorrow over the store's raising in the 1992 riots in Los Angeles has died. He was 96. It's August 16th, 2002, LA Times. Ligon operated the Aquarian Bookshop in 1941 and watched its success rise and fall with society's interest in black history. Operated, opened when Los Angeles population was less than 5% African American. The store was ahead of its time, in providing black writers and uh, promoting black writers and cultural, black cultural development. Wygon opened the shop with $100 saved from his salary as a Southern Pacific Railroad waiter. He brought, bought fiction, nonfiction, metaphysical books from a secondhand shop downtown. Okay, you can search. The store puttered along until the civil rights movement and corresponding interest in black history transformed the shop into a hub of cultural activity 
lectures, classes on black history, and small theatrical productions. Now, I was around for this as a shorty. So some of the classes that were happening on 48th Street, which is like, I lived on 48th Street, so Aquarian was actually uh, partial on 48th Street and also on Western, which is basically right there. And so part of what was going on was in addition to this, so you had the Black Panthers on one side who were creating social programs, you had the US organization on the other side, or another yeah, side of the continuum, which is basically into African culture and talking about African culture. And a lot of it was fueled by people going to the Ligon's bookstore. So you have a cultural center in which you have classes on astrology and you know, ancient e Egyptian philosophy and Du Bois and black writers like Maya Angelou and Alice Walker and all these other folks in one place. This is where I learned, well, not so much where I learned because when I went there, I saw, oh, these books are at home. Okay. So start talking about people about, look, let's go with black writers. Look at that. So works by Holland Renaissance luminaries, including Langston Hughes and hosted authors such as Alex Haley and Maya Angelou were well stocked. Ligon, who ran the shop with his wife Bernice, also made available uh, to researchers his collection of historic documents that included drafts of Marcus Garvey's speeches and letters of W.E.B. Du Bois. So the following was from one of the newsletters the bookstore put out, Uraeus, also known as Black Gnosis. So when I'm talking about a revolution brewing, this is going to be internal because part of what has to happen is not only do African, Africans in America have to start thinking well of themselves by studying their own history and philosophy and being able to create a system that's more equitable than the one that we live in, how do you handle yourself internally when you deal with certain things in terms of anger and spirituality and all these other kinds of things? So, yes? So did Marcus Gavi uh, go away to Africa? Marcus uh, went to, well, he went back, he was deported to Jamaica. I think that's where he died, yes? He was deported to Jamaica. Say again? He was deported to Jamaica. He was deported to Jamaica, yeah. What did he? For? Tax fraud. Oh, from here? Yeah. So yeah. Why, why deport him to Jamaica? Uh, well, he's from there. Oh, okay. And he was a foreign national, and yeah, the, yeah. we actually cover that second term, but right. essentially, it was BS. Yeah. Black Gnosis, back to slide, thank you. So this is a quote. African science is in many fundamental ways different than European science, for it emphasizes a holistic approach, a combination of feelings and logic, material and ideal, and the scientific and religious. The African scientist first feels intuitively and then focuses that which he, she feels with logic, whereas many Europeans first think logically and then hide from or, or ignore his or her feelings. So Uraeus is a publication dealing with black metaphysical thought published out of Aquarian on 48th Street in South Central. So what a Uraeus is, it's, a, it's an animal or an idealized animal separate conversation, but Uraeus is a winged cobra. Now, many Egyptian figures, you'll see the pharaonic figures of cobra coming out of their third eye point. You also see the caduceus. 
You're talking about with pharaohs, yeah? Yeah. You also see the caduceus, which is basically two snakes intertwined at seven places. They're staring at the third eye point, and then there's another point. This is where the wings come out of the caduceus. Staff. Each one of those are your races too. So the caduceus is two cobras intertwined. Symbolic of uh, the metaphysical part of the human being. So there are classes in Egyptian history, black American history, natural healing, astrology, martial arts, meditation, African languages and cultures, and basically one of the models for black bookstores. So. So to break this down, African science is in many fundamental ways different than European science for it emphasizes a holistic approach. A combination of feelings and logic, material and ideal, the scientific and religious, the African scientist first feels intuitively, then focuses that which he, she feels with logic. Now the logic system, uh, as uh, Nichols talks about within axiology, it's diunital logic, the union of opposites. That is, I am a part of this. This thing that I'm observing is part of me. They, whoever they is, is part of us. Subject, object. The beginning process is reflected in the end. So you have to love, you basically, no, the ends don't justify the means. What you do in the beginning to the least of these is done, you're doing to me. So make sure that you're coming correct from the beginning, from Jump Street. Love your enemy. What you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. So whereas many people, very, many Europeans think logically, and it's dichotomous logic, that is polar opposites. I'm not a part of that. If you're not with us, you're against us. Subject is an object. Ends justify the means. Winning is everything. You could define evil as acting as if you are not connected and that there's no consequences to your actions. Right? So an African knows, look, what goes around comes around. You are connected to your actions. Any action. And that's like it's science. It's repeatable. It's replicable. Within this framework, it's obvious that there is an ordered intelligence to the universe. There's no question necessarily about whether there's, you know, whatever you call it, supreme being God, that's like as obvious as the sun. Something is keeping this together, and I'm part of that something. But God isn't some white dude up in heaven throwing thunderbolts with a long white beard. No, we're not down with that. But as an intelligence that we participate in, that we're part of, yeah, we could be down with that. So winning, yeah, ends justify the means, winning is everything. And then hide from or ignore his or her feelings, also consequences of those actions. So dialectic, the tension that d exists between two conflicting or interacting forces, elements, or ideas, investigation of the truth through discussion, or the art of investigating truth through discussion. Debate, uh, dialectic, or dialectics, debate intended to resolve a conflict between two contradicting or apparently contradictory ideas or elements logically, establishing truths on both sides rather than disproving one argument. So what a dialectic is, is, oh look, I need to understand the racists. Why do they believe what they believe? I don't have to believe what they believe. I have to understand why they believe what they believe. Why would you create a system that benefits a few and oppresses many? And why would you keep that in place? Why would you fight to keep that in place? What are you afraid of? Because there are fears. What are you afraid of? 
And how do you control or con people into keeping that going? How do you do that? So, I mean, you can see where <laughs> if this is a bookstore where they're talking about stuff like this, oh, we can't have that. But it was preserved during the Watts riots in 65, but suddenly destroyed in the rebellion of 92? How is that happening? The process in uh, dialectic, this is still definition dialectic, in Hegelian and Marxist thought in which two apparently opposed ideas, the thesis and antithesis become combined in a unified whole, the synthesis. Now, it must be pointed out, however correct you may think Marx's critique of capitalism is, he and Hegel are white supremacists. So they believe in white racial superiority. That is, you know, they may critique capitalism and Marx may say, oh, well, slavery is simply the primitive accumulation of capital. That is, black human beings are property, not people. That's the view. So we shouldn't end slavery because it's morally wrong. It's just inefficient economics. Uh, yeah. We not people. And there's better ways of making money, you calling it socialism? Hmm. Method used by Socratic in Socratic philosophy to reveal truth through disputation. Okay, so these are concepts basically in English, which of course is Western thought. African thoughts, Africans though trained in Western thought feel differently and those feelings guide their action. All right, so the Ku Klux Klan and Martin Luther King use the King James Version of the Bible to justify their actions. This is a dialectic. Two mutually opposed that can agree on a synthesis of a book that basically came from an African form, an African religion, but is the Western form of an African religion. And therefore, there are certain conclusions that are that could be made from it. So in liberation theology, we say, okay, we're going to follow Jesus' words only and his actions. In, non, in salvation theology, we go, oh, well, we'll deal with Paul. Paul said, be a good slave and obey your master. Turn the other cheek. No, we're not down with that. Sorry. We don't believe that God created white people to rule over the planet. We're not buying that. I'm sorry. Paul was an agent of the world. Yeah. So, an internal revolution was brewing. Black Panthers, American Indian Movement, that's AIM. Brown Berets, White Panthers, Gray Panthers, that is basically advocating for elders' rights. Hippies, yippies. White Panthers were white people that were politically aligned with Black Panthers. And also basically looking in terms of doing anti-racism and anti-sexism work. They're also a group of a lot of students for Democratic Society, SDS, the Weather Other Underground. Education. Say again? Education for everybody. Yeah. Right? So Black Panthers were primarily black people, right? White Panthers, oh, we are in solidarity with you. Gray Panthers, oh, well, we have militant old people who are basically essentially being oppressed too. And organizing for, you know, in terms of uh, in dealing with ageism. Hippies, yippies. So, uh, so uh, an internal revolution was brewing and the means to, and the, as was the means to counter it. So, the old methods are best. So one of them is the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. 
I know people, I was talking with my mom over the weekend, she said, why did you go into this whole drug thing? Uh, there's a reason. Why did they go into this whole drug thing? I'll show you. So, during this time, in the 1960s, there's the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. So we're talking about the old methods of control. Controls that Substances Act of 1970, which is our current drug laws, ethnic specific bioweapon research. I noticed there was an outbreak of valley fever in Fresno, reading the newspaper. Valley fever is a fungus borne disease kicked up when the wind kicks up certain dust or when animals move through an area. Valley fever was part of a program of ethnic-specific bioweapon research. What that means is the United States government, as well as others, but let's just focus on the United States government, had a program to counter the civil rights movement and the movements of the Panthers, AIM, the Brown Berets, uh, the Asian movements, ethnic specific bioweapons means they're looking for biological agents that will affect people of color and leave the largely white army intact. They were proposing on the surface that what if we got into a war with China? And we were going to have to, and well, if we're not going to use nukes, we have to way of neutralizing that army. So what if we came up with a disease agent that we could spread on the battlefield that would kill all those folks without killing us? Us being, well, these are white people thinking this, us being us, U.S., as in just us. So ethnic specific bioweapon research. So they poured money into looking at biological weapons that could take out black people, brown people, Asian people, Native Americans. I said Asians, right? And not white people. That's what that was. That started during this time. So looking at mass infection of specific populations, Illegal tactics to influence elections, like Watergate. Illegal invasions of countries without declaring war. Cambodia, Laos, oh, Vietnam. Protests and suppression of protests for all kinds of reasons and causes. So for example, Kent State, Cambodia strike, Alcatraz, wounded knee. Oops, let me go back for a second. So a revolution was basically brewing. Coming out of the civil rights movement, black power movement, and beginning to morph, uh, that meme was beginning to, meet, to morph into other ethnic groups who were also uh, forming alliances across lines. Right? Just like I showed you last week with the Black Panther Party in Eugene making alliance with the White Patriot Party who were aligned with the Black Panthers. So today, the Patriots tend to be racist then they weren't, okay? Because they saw a common cause. So how do you break that up? The old methods are the best. So let's start with Controlled Substances Act of 1970 because this is fiendishly clever. All right, so this is a construct um, that I uh, developed uh, riffing off of the top part, which the so don't make any associations with Christianity. It's not what the cross is about. 
Peter Bell had this construct about a culture decides which substances... So basically, there are very few human cultures that don't use chemicals that alter your consciousness. Like, there's nearly nobody that doesn't. Right? So a culture decides which substances are okay and are not okay. And then, go back to the slide, thanks. What's okay and what's not okay, and then if it is okay, who, when, and what context you can use, and if it's not okay, what sanctions and or exceptions you will use against particular people. So, for example, let's take alcohol. All right, so alcohol technology can exist anywhere you have an agricultural surplus. But in order to have alcohol, you have to have agriculture first. Or access to enough fruit and or grain and or water where those things can ferment naturally. All right? The Egyptians invented distilled spirits. So you basically take beer or wine strength alcohol and you boil off the water in a pressure cooker and it concentrates the alcohol so you actually have to have metallurgy to be able to make a still. If you don't have metallurgy, no still, you just have beer and wine strength alcohol. Native Americans had alcohol technology but not distilled spirits. Okay, so 4,000 years ago, natives basically said, okay, pregnant women, so with alcohol, Okay, who can use alcohol? So, only if you're an adult, only in ceremony, and not to intoxication. And who, and who are the exceptions who are not okay? Pregnant women and children. And they made an association that alcohol hurt the fetus, the developing fetus, 4,000 years ago. which is also about the time roughly that, so, so for example, three Abrahamic religions make separate policies with alcohol. Christians, oh, alcohol is okay. Muslims, nah. Jews, uh, ceremonially. All right, so that's a policy. That's okay, not okay, when you can use it, when not to use it, etc. So the sanctions. In, native, in Indian country for violating the alcohol policy. So let's take Aztecs because that was the most radical. All right? So Aztec alcohol law went like this. is to follow the basic Native American pattern, only in ceremony, not kids, non-pregnant adults, not to intoxication. All right? So if you're an upper class person, that is you're a culture bearer, you're like a priest, you're a warrior, whatever. If you are publicly drunk, so one, you violated oh, not to intoxication, two, you're using outside a ceremony, if you're publicly drunk, you're executed, first offense. If you're a lower class person, publicly drunk outside a ceremony, because remember in the ceremony you're not publicly drunk, or drunk, you're beaten up, and second offense, you're executed. Think alcoholism would be high in Aztec culture? No. What if we executed drunk drivers in a fatality? Uh, Bulgaria and El Salvador do. Hmm. Will we have less drunk drivers, you think? Maybe. I don't know. It seems harsh, but... There it is. That, that's basically the, the model. So, what I added to Peter's basic model was, I said, okay, this doesn't have a deep cultural analysis. I mean, he's cool, I like him, but, okay, we need to go deeper. There are uses of substances from medicine, sacrament, inspiration, leisure, commodity, political tool, and weapon. And that has to be factored into his analysis. All right? So, first use of any drug substance is as a medicine to heal illnesses of mind and body. Second is a sacrament 
Sacrament means sacred mind. To induce a particular state that's conducive to whatever your religious or spiritual beliefs are. Third, inspiration. That is, oh, I'm an artist and I really like that guitar line I'm playing. I just, it just inspires me or it inspires me to do great art. When I take, you know, this opium pill or not opium pill, when I smoke this opium or whatever, you know, take LSD and I great, do great, great drawings, etc., etc. It inspires me. Use of substance as an inspiration. Inspiration leads to leisure. That is, oh, this is what I do to kick back. Not paint, just to kick back. I need to de-stress. Once these two things are happening within a culture, it leads to the possibility that that substance can be a commodity and people can make money from it. Once you have a civilization that's based on the accumulation of such commodities, you can use that excess wealth to generate a political tool. All right? So, in America, let's talk about America because that's where we are. Who's the father of our country? Come on, you know this, right? Who's the father of our country? George Washington. George Washington. Okay. In Virginia, when they had an election, only landed rich white guys could vote, right? A common practice to influence elections was to be outside the poll and hand out jugs of rum. Vote for me. He didn't do that, and he lost his first election because he took a moral stand. No, I'm not going to get the... They should vote for me sober. Didn't win. So, then he did, the next election, he did hand out jugs of rum, and he won, and the rest is history. Drug counselors know secret stuff, right? You didn't learn that about George Washington, right? Yeah, well. Was that his second election for presidency? No, okay. before. All right, political tool or weapon. So, if you understand that politics is a science of power, right, then that opens the possibility that you can use a drug substance as a weapon against particular populations, either to control them, to kill them, or otherwise render them ineffective. So you can see where, why I took off from Peter's model, because it's nice, but let's get to the real brass tacks here. So, medicine the weapon. So, often, in cultures of tradition, information about drug substances was intentionally limited by practitioners involved with drug technology or various sorts of nobility. So, for example, Egyptian nobility kept the secret of distilled spirits to themselves. It was a state secret until they got conquered by the Greeks. Then, the secret on how to make distilled spirits leaked out without the cultural... <laughs> breaks, right? Because the Egyptians said, no, we can't let this stuff out. Yeah, we could make money from it, but we're not going to do that because it's going to have a bad influence on people's spirits. Let the people have their beer and wine. We can't stop that. We can't change the weather. But we can control distilled spirits. And they did until they were conquered. The secret of how to make distilled spirits got out and then what you have is then the Puritans giving rum to four-year-olds to put them to sleep in the 1600s, which we would think is crazy. And then, but the concept then that goes along with that is that once you start giving a rum, rum to a four-year-old, they grow up, and when they're an adult at 13, and you have this rule, the English common law rule of thumb, that you can beat your wife and children as long as the stick that you use is no thicker than your thumb. If the person is drunk, it's not the alcohol that's the problem. The person has low moral character. Right? The alcohol is seen as like water. They literally call it the aqua vitae. 
which is not a value they got from the Egyptians. The Egyptians said this stuff could clearly have bad effects on your spirit if it was let out. So they didn't let it out, right? So the cultural values from Africa did not get replicated by the Christians. Early Greeks and, the, and then the Christians in Western civilization, right? So is, that's why I go back to slide. Intentionally limited drug technology. So you had to either be nobility or a practitioner. Once the drug technology gets out of the hands of the healers into the drug sellers, you create all kinds of other problems. Because then the value becomes not the health of the people, but profit. All right? So cross-culturally, around the world, the uses of drug substances range from being used as a medicine to being used as a weapon. Sometimes different uses are combined depending on the culture involved. So when I talked that when I invented the concept of axiochemistry, in traditional African-based cultures, relationships are what are most highly valued in traditional African-based cultures. So relationships include kinship with human beings as well as their ancestors and the supernatural and natural worlds. That goes along with the whole black gnosis thing. That's what they're trying to reinvigorate with that bookstore. The purpose of a drug substance, then, was to maintain, enhance, or restore a balanced relationship with yourself or with other people. When the use of that substance ex exceeded that balance as in a state of intoxication or continued excessive use, it was not the substance that was the f at fault, but the person and the relationship to the substance that was out of balance. So you might restore that balance by abstaining from the substance while developing a more balanced and healthy relationship. Okay? The spirit of the person, their soul, was considered stronger than the substance. So that they could drop the substance if you could develop their spirit strong enough. Right? Thus, prevention of addictions accomplished by education, strengthen the individual by improving their relationship to themselves and self-knowledge. Okay? In other words, you keep yourself strong, you keep us strong. So let's see, we're going to go out in a couple of minutes, so I'll just continue this. So herbal drugs, medicines contained in wild plants, first medicines, alcohol drinks were drunk for health, as well as recreation, because often water was contaminated and alcohol killed bacteria. So I just said that, state secret. Got it. One minute. Okay. So let's uh, continue this. The basic bottom line is when we st established in 1970 a Controlled Substances Act, it was essentially to make certain sacraments of people of color illegal that were non-addictive. And that was basically a cultural attack. And then have different sanctions against different, applied against different populations. So that even though the data showed that most of the illegal drug users were white people, they weren't the ones being sanctioned. The people that were being sanctioned were people of color. So we'll continue this more on Wednesday.
online. Learn.